I've been asked uh, to introduce our very good friends, Nancy and Jim Howard. I see Nancy shaking her head slightly. Uh, you know, you've read the, the story here, I imagine, most of you. So you know about degrees and about naval service, about um, being the chairman of a mission board, about being, oh, an auditor, about doing a PhD in New Testament. <laughs> it should have been Old Testament, you know. <clears throat> but it doesn't tell you everything. Jim and Nancy have been very kind to us and let us be part of their lives since he was in my class some years ago. One of the things that they're very good, up, good at and isn't in the brochure is hospitality. They've welcomed us on more than one occasion to their home. And uh, it's part of that that brings Jim here today. They were in Germany involved in a in running a hospitality house, I think they called it. Is that right? Yeah. And in the process, Nancy observed that Jim's ability to organize for hospitality was somewhat lacking. <laughs> and as a result, he thought, "Oh, I think I'll help with, I think I'll help with the WEC conference at DTS, and and maybe learn a little bit about organization." So, Nancy, would you just stand and let us wave at you? Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. The, uh, the story on the brochure doesn't talk about obstacles, but we have had the privilege of seeing Jim and Nancy work through obstacles. So when he comes to talk to you today, you will know that uh, it isn't just words on a piece of paper of things that he can do, things that she can do, things that they've done together, but it involves the activity of God in their lives. And we've been privileged to see that, to see how God can take people who want to serve him and give them ways to do that and work in their lives to help them to grow and to help them to help others grow. So, without further ado, I would love to introduce you to our good friend, Dr. James M. Howard. I forgot you knew them uh -huh. about the WIC committee. I keep telling Dorian, but she doesn't quite get it, that uh, the Old Testament majors had to study two-thirds of the Bible, and the New Testament majors had to study all 66 books and a whole lot more. <laughs> so it actually seems like we had the tougher degree of all of those. Well, Nancy and I had thought carefully about what we could bring you from Colorado, so we tried to think through what we're known for in this wonderful state of Colorado. Um, <clears throat> it's very high. <laughs> Lots of snow and cold, and so we thought about uh, Colorado as the home of the microbreweries. There's more microbreweries in Colorado than any other state, but I remember we're at DTS, so we can't do that. So we thought maybe we'd bring you snow, but that doesn't transfer very well. In fact, uh, if you have grandkids, you've seen the movie Frozen, where the man says to the snowman who longs to be on the beach that uh, he longed to be on the beach, and he says, you don't have much experience with heat, do you? And um, so then we thought, well, marijuana. But they wouldn't let me bring it on the plane. <laughs> so we couldn't do that either. It's very, uh, it's very good to be here uh, with you. It's good to be back on campus again. <clears throat> the year is 30 AD. And you have just finished uh, your first trip of the morning out catching fish. And uh, you've been pr pretty successful. And so you're back and you're on the seashore and you're taking care of the fish and maybe mending nets and doing some things with the boat and your crew. And along comes this man who uh, you don't know who he is. You know very little about him. You certainly don't know that he's the Messiah. 
And uh, all that you know is that he's some kind of teacher. And he says, um, come follow me. Just leave everything. Drop everything. Your business, leave your employees behind. The gospels tell us, and come follow me. What would incite you to do that? Especially since you didn't really know who he was. In fact, the gospels are the journey of the disciples learning who he was. Right? They had an inkling. They had some pieces of information, but they didn't really know who he was. What would cause them to leave everything behind and follow this person? So you decide to do that. You close up shop. You leave your business employees behind, and you take off. And what a surprise that he does the unexpected. You don't find a nice place to sit down and begin learning. No, he begins to uh, go after people that are unclean. He's not afraid to be touched by a woman with an issue of blood. He's not afraid to, to physically touch people who have died. He's not afraid to um, handle lepers, any of that. In other words, I kind of look at it as he's willing to get his hands dirty. He's willing to become unclean for us. It wasn't what they expected, I'm sure. It's not what the uh, great teachers did and later on the rabbis, but that's what Jesus did. And as you had grown up in this land, you had seen crucifixion. So you had seen people led to the cross. You knew about the um, excruciating form of torture. It's insightful to me that the gospel authors decide to tell us very little about the actual execution of Jesus. They instead focus on his response. In our church, we're focusing relent on the seven last statements of Jesus. And uh, the gospel writers decided not to give us a lot of detail. We have to go outside the Bible for that. And that's insightful. Because it, it's important because the people that were there, like all of us, if we had been there, we would have known about all those details. We would have understood it. We would have experienced all that. And so it would have been a statement to us that the gospel writers did not tell us those details. Instead, they focused on the dignity of Christ. They focused on his mission, his willingness to say, Father, forgive them. As soon as they hang him up on the tree, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. Luke chapter 23. You would have seen all that. You would have seen the shame, the honor, the dishonor. You would have seen the embarrassment, the humiliation. You would have noticed, for instance, that it was pretty much reserved for the lower class and the criminals. Uh, upper class didn't much, pretty much die that way. You would have seen that. So what a surprise when he says to them, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What a surprise. Um, discipleship in the first century world for some was a means of, uh, it was a means of uh, earning money. It was a career. You wanted to be a teacher. They earn money doing that. And yet Jesus is saying, you have to deny yourself and take up this cross. You probably would have seen at least once, maybe you knew a friend, that had had to carry that heavy crossbar out of the city to the place of execution. You might have seen that. You're asking me to do that? I wonder if that's what they thought they were signing on for the day that they closed their business and walked away from the fishing boats. Not sure what they were getting into. I wonder if they anticipated this is going to cost me everything that I had to follow this person. I don't think so. I don't think they did. Well, a clue is given in verse 25. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for me will find it. It's a paradox. It's one of the paradoxes in Scripture. There are many. This is one of them. Saving your life leads to losing. By the way, I'm in Matthew 16, the theme for the conference, sacrifice. Matthew 16, 24 and 25. Saving your life leads to losing, and losing your life leads to saving. If your goal is to maximize your personal happiness, you will lose. You will lose. If your goal instead is to serve Christ above all else, then you will find life. That statement says something about the way God created us. And this week we're going to explore throughout the week, what does that mean? 
We're going to look at sacrifice. There's many different ways we could go with this idea, and I've chosen four. We're going to look at what this means, this paradox, and find a little about, out a little bit about who God is and a whole lot about who we are and honestly what we're created for. You're not created to seek your own life. That's how you lose it. But before we do that, we need to understand how Christ sacrificed himself. And so what I want to do is I want to step back into the Hebrew Scriptures um, and take a look at sacrifice. But first, a word about hermeneutics. One of the uh, most life-changing classes I took here was with uh, Dr. Fanning, uh, twice, master's and PhD in um, Hebrews. I think once is enough, but apparently it's not. You get to take it a lot. And, um, and what I discovered in Hebrews was a real, un, a real wonderful hermeneutic for how to interpret the Bible. You have the Old Testament and you have the New Testament. And you're going to see me use this, this paradigm uh, frequently because when I left here, I realized this was one of the areas that I was weak in, not sure how to put the two of them together. I hadn't done that very well here. So I had to spend a lot of time uh, doing that. And honestly, in my own personal study time, probably 50% of my time is spent studying Old Testament uh, cultural backgrounds for both uh, uh, Semitic culture as well as Greco-Roman culture. I spend a lot of time reading because it unfolds the scriptures. It opens them up to me. So you have the Old Testament and then you have the New. Hebrews calls the Old Testament a shadow. It's a shadow of what's coming. It's, uh, or as Paul said, I think we see through a glass darkly. It's a shadow. It's not reality. It provides us almost, if you will, a picture book. We can walk up and we can touch the stones of the temple. We can hear the animals uh, bleeding, and especially as they take their life. If you've ever been in a, a temple anywhere in Asia where they, or any other country where they take lives, you know what I'm talking about. You could smell the, the, the animal. It, it's not a very pleasant smell. So the Old Testament provides this very tangible picture that helps us understand true spiritual reality, what we live with today. And in between those two is Christ. So what we have is we have all these images and pictures that are created in the Old Testament, a very tangible picture. And then when we come to Christ, we find that he's fulfilling all that, but he's doing a lot more than that. He's redefining it. He's re-envisioning it. He's opening up our eyes to what those meant. So the New Testament authors take all this language and they use it all over again. <coughs> So all of a sudden, we are a spiritual temple. Having taught overseas for 15 years, uh, I've been in many Buddhist and Hindu temples. And I find that that's not a very good place to define what it means to be a, a living temple, a spiritual temple. Where do I go to capture the essence of that idea, that metaphor? I'll go back into the Old Testament, look at the Jewish temple. So what happened in the Jewish temple? This is just an example. This is where they celebrated all the great festivals, the dancing, the partying, the festival of booths. So later rabbis tell us they, they had music for eight days, nonstop. So when the world looks at us, do they see us dancing, partying? Uh, I love the worship set this morning. One of the things I had to recapture when I left the seminary, when I was here, uh, oh, there's Dr. Fanning. Now I get really nervous when I see Dr. No, I'm just kidding, Dr. Fanning. <laughs> So uh, when, I, when I left here, we, students all wore coat and tie when I was here. So we were a little, un, you know, a little bridled. And we had to learn what it meant to raise our hands and dance, at least as much as a white boy could. And, um, <laughs> and so I worked on that. So the, when we look at this, we see, is, does the world, when they look at us, do they see us celebrating and dancing? When they look here and they see that this is where you come to have all of your conflicts uh, worked through. The priests would help you resolve it. The teachers, that's what they were supposed to do. When they look at us, do they see us resolving conflicts or do they see us suing each other? So you understand the picture. We can go back into the Old Testament and capture a glimpse of this shadow, this tangible reality to help us understand true spirituality. So every day this week, we're going to take a, a moment and look at an Old Testament, look into the Old Testament for principles to help us grasp. What does it mean that we are a sacrifice? We have to look at what a sacrifice is. What does it mean that we are priests, a kingdom of priests, 1 Peter 2? We have to go back into the Old Testament and get a picture of what it means to be a priest. And then as we weave our way from the Hebrew Scriptures through what Christ did, it begins to just blossom in the New Testament. And it moves in wonderful directions. In fact, it moves in wonderful direction into every part of the world. All the nations are represented. The New Testament is itself a picture, the first true model, I believe, of a healthy multicultural ethic. Most of the Old Testament was devoted to the Israelites, helping them see that they were to be a blessing to the world. 
The New Testament, especially Acts 8, 1 and on, is all the nations. So Corinthians is written to the Greeks. Right? Romans is written to Italians. You have many epistles written to the uh, Asia Minor, provinces of Asia Minor, current day Turkey. Uh, depending on your viewpoint, James written to Jewish Christians. You have Crete written, I mean, uh, Titus written to Crete. So the New Testament is itself a model, a multicultural model of moving into the world and fulfilling the promise that God originally made to Abraham. And we're going to see that. So let's say just a word about sacrifices in the Old Testament. This is a complex area of study. I told Dorian I spent the last, I think, two months just reading on sacrifice. And the thought of, of capturing sacrifice in 15 minutes is daunting. Okay, so we're not going to go back and look at all the sacrifices and try to unpack them. You'll do that in some of your classes, especially the Old Testament majors and some of the others. But I want to give you a sense of general principles. Let me put it that way. General principles of what the sacrificial system was all about. Why the sacrificial system? Why even create these rituals? Well, they established communion with the Lord. I came up, I kind of consolidated everybody's writings, came up with eight basic principles, which I see unfolded in the New Testament. The sacrifices, the ritual system, established communion with the Lord. It was a way of, of connecting with this God, which was very important in the ancient world where they served lots and lots of gods. I was teaching in India one time, and like a good American, I... Uh, said, uh, I was talking in Ephesians about one God, one mediator. And I said, this is a model for what unity is. And all, a bunch of my students started to laugh. And I've learned that when that happens, I have stepped across a cultural chasm somewhere. And so I'm about to learn something. So I asked them, I said, what are you guys laughing at? And they said, sir, you don't really understand. We serve 334 million gods in Hinduism. We can't be unified. It's not possible. And it dawned on me that this statement about we worship one God is the core of our theology. I praise God that we don't worship two gods, much less millions of gods. So this whole sacrificial system in this horribly dark world, as the Old Testament and the New Testament call it, was a way to commune with God. It was a way to um, find this communion which we are created for. Secondly, they provided for atonement. So the sacrifice is provided for atonement, or you might use the word cleansing just to make it understandable or accessible. They cleanse the temple, the people. They cleanse the priests in order to provide for reconciliation. Now, when I tell you these principles, I want you to, to automatically start connecting the dots down here in the New Testament where you see this language repeated. Okay? Communion, reconciliation, atonement, because it involves us. They also, number three, established a means for thanking the Lord and cultivating a grateful heart. If, when this one true God decided to speak to them at Sinai, um, I don't know what they would have thought. They had seen the ten plagues, Exodus 19, and when he finally meets them face to face. But how do you worship this God and how do you thank this God? My experience around the world has taught me that uh, in religions that have lots of gods, the goal is not communion. That's not really the goal. Uh, the goal is not a grateful heart. The goal is appeasement, it seems to me. They're trying to appease the gods. They just want the gods to keep everything working and bless them uh, and to help them. So they, they provided a means for thanking the Lord or cultivating a grateful heart. Fourth, the sacrificial system provided a way for the people to remember all that God had done. It was a constant reminder, much like we do with communion. It's a constant reminder, isn't it? In our church, we, uh, we do communion every week specifically to remind people every week to proclaim the Lord's death. Proclaim it to whom? We'll come back to that. So it was a way for the people to remember all that God had done. Fifth, the sacrifices provided a means of establishing peace with God and each other. When you messed up, there was something you could do, tangible, to, to restore this peace with God and, and with each other. If you had hurt each other, there was things that you could do built into the law on how to reestablish those relationships. Six, they taught the Israelites the difference between the holy and the common, the unclean. They began to craft a clear picture of not only what was holy, but what was not holy, 
and more importantly, how to handle this holiness in the context of this broken world. That becomes very important in discussions on sanctification in the New Testament. How do we live as holy people in an unclean, uncommon, I mean a common, unclean world? How do we do that? We were made to live in that world. We just weren't made to be tainted by it. We were made to exist within the context of brokenness. Uh, That's why God sent his spirit, I believe that. We can do that. Seven, they provided a process by which the, uh, the person who strayed from the Lord in community could be restored back to the community. So it's a way of, of uh, what do you do when a person has hurt you so deeply in the community that it's really hard to forgive? There has to be something in place while we live in this part of the, of, of, uh, when we live in the world, in a broken world, that would restore them back into fellowship with us. And then finally, they were a means of grace and constantly bringing the people back to God. Uh, perhaps that's what's behind John's idea in John 1.16, grace upon grace. He saw what God had done as a means of grace, and this was a means of bringing them back. So then how is this applied to Christ? If we can answer this question of how these principles are applied to Christ, then we can have a glimpse of what it means to understand the Old Testament sacrificial system and for us to live that out daily in our lives. It's very easy just to take this idea and compress it into one thing and talk about what you give up. My basic idea today is that sacrifice is not about what you give up. That's not it at all. It's about what you do for others. That's the basic core meaning behind sacrifice. It's what do you do for others that costs you something. It's not about what you give up. So let's, let me just say a word about what it does with Christ. This is not new to you, so I'm going to fly through it. Hebrews 9 and 10 provides us a fantastic picture of the sacrifice and high priesthood of Christ. So in Hebrews 9, and by the way, this is where you see all that language of shadow and reality. These two ideas between the Old Testament and the New. So this is not new to you. The priest's work and the rituals, which were the shadow, were incomplete. But Christ's work, which is reality, is finished. So you see how the Old Testament, I mean, the Hebrews takes the Old Testament and gives us a picture that this is incomplete. It just gives us information about something to help us understand true reality right down here. What's happening? Well, the blood of the sacrifices, which was a shadow, was in, were inadequate. Hebrews 9.13. But Christ's blood, which is reality, is sufficient. The Old Covenant, which was a shadow, was powerless to save But the new covenant, which is reality, is powerful to save. Hebrews 9, Hebrews 10. The tabernacle, its utensils, all the people that needed regular atoning sacrifices to be cleansed is a shadow. But Christ's sacrifice, which is reality, is eternal. Hebrews 9, 23 through 28. Hebrews 10 goes on and adds to that. The law is shown to be insufficient, while Christ's Christ's sacrifice is shown to be both sufficient and eternal. By the way, we learn these wonderful truths here. Learn how to make them accessible not only to yourself, but to the people you're going to minister to. Um, Fully God, fully human, united in one body forever. Hypostatic union. It's a wonderful thing to learn until I realized nobody was going to ask me that question. (laughs) What does that mean? But what my people were interested in in my church was the idea that Christ's sacrifice is a lot bigger than the death on the cross. He is fully human forever. And he appears in Revelation in the temple, the new temple, the new Jerusalem. His sacrifice is actually eternal, not only in its efficacy, but in its actual, the way he lives life. It's fully human forever. And all of a sudden, Christ becomes much more accessible to us because that's how much he loves us, to sacrifice himself for all time. So, the law is only a shadow of the good things to come, Hebrews 10. Animal sacrifices are the shadow. They reveal the inadequacy of the law, Hebrews 10.1. But Christ's sacrifice and ministry is eternal and makes us holy. The priests, they're just a shadow, are required to perform their ministry daily, Hebrews 10, 11. But Christ's priesthood, reality, perfects us forever, Hebrews 10, 12 to 14. So you get this idea of how these two relate to each other, that we can, if we want to grasp more dimensions of true spiritual reality, 
Let's take a look back into the Old Testament to see it. We're going to do more of that the rest of the week. The primary difference is that in sacrifice between Christ and us is that sacrifice is captured in his death. That's what the cross models us. In fact, I told my church on Sunday, we're spending seven weeks in Lent, and uh, we need to have a crucifix hanging up here because we're focusing on Jesus' last hour. None of us have a crucifix. We had a Catholic in our midst who died laughing. She said, I have a thousand. <laughs> and for seven weeks, we need to hang the crucifix up because we're focusing on what Christ did on the cross. And then on Easter, we take it down and replace it with the cross. So in, Christ, in the case of Christ, the sacrifice is focused on his... Uh, cool. <laughs> we could bring that to our church. That was really cool how you did that. <laughs> it's focused on his death, but in our case, it's focused on our lives, how we live our lives. Sacrifice is a statement about the way we live our lives. So let me go back through those eight principles and let me tie them to us today. So we're going to move through from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Number one, we are living sacrifices. In the Old Testament, people presented sacrifices to God, but in the New Testament, Christ presents himself as a sacrifice on our behalf, right? Now, what does Hebrews argue? Hebrews argues that a sacrifice cannot be a sacrifice on its own behalf, right? So you're going to hear me say this type of language all week. When Paul says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, the first question you should ask is, on behalf of whom? Right. We are sacrificing to God, but on behalf of whom? It's interesting, that's Hebrews 12.1. I believe every imperative after Hebrews 12.1, every command, is focused on how we live our lives together. How we live our lives together. So who are we sacrificing on behalf of? So Hebrews 12.1 gives us the model. Sacrifices cannot be made on their own half. They're always made to God. I think this is a true meaning of Hebrews 12.1. If we are to present ourselves as living sacrifices, on whose behalf? You tell me on whose behalf. Who? Others? Others, right? Not ourselves, right? The language that Peter and Paul use, sacrifice and priesthood, are designed to move us outside of ourselves. That's what they're designed to do. We're designed to be priests. Peter says we are a kingdom of priests. We'll look at that one tomorrow, that whole idea of priesthood. What does it mean to be a kingdom of priests? On behalf of whom? It's not about you. It's about the way you live your life in the presence of a broken world. It's about the nations. If you understand that the gospel is beginning from creation to new creation is the good news that God has not forgotten us. He remembered his promise, his covenant. He did not forget us. When Jesus was born, he was called Emmanuel, God with us. From beginning to end, creation to new creation, the message is God wants to reach this world. When I stand in front of somebody, I, I went to get my hair cut it when I first moved to Summit County and the lady's cutting my hair. I, I'm confident of two things. No hesitation at all in my theology. Number one, God loves her much more passionately than I do. And number two, God has been involved in her life much longer and in a more effective way than I ever will be. I'm convinced of those two things. So therefore, I'm sitting there getting a haircut and you know what? I have confidence that God put me there on purpose. So I ask her, do you go to church? No, nah, I don't believe any of that Christian stuff. Oh, so, so do you go to church? And she said, well, I just told you I don't believe any of that stuff. Well, I know a lot of people that go to church that don't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> and that started a conversation. Nine months later, I know that she's been divorced. I know a lot, a lot about the pain in her life. I know about her brother who has been through... Uh, uh, 28, had uh, several major strokes, barely survived, and she cares for him. I know a lot about her life. I know a lot about it. Because I have confidence that God uh, cares about her more than I do. And he put me there on purpose. So this whole idea of a living sacrifice, it's not what we give up, it's what we do for others. It's being, being willing to pay a cost on behalf of the people around us. The second principle, we are reconcilers. Just as the Old Testament sacrifices brought the people into fellowship with God, so God brought us into communion and fellowship with him and each other. And through the process of atonement, he reconciled us to God. This becomes a model for us. 2 Corinthians 5. What does 2 Corinthians 5, 19 through 21 tell us? What does it tell us? We are what? 
Yeah, reconciliation. We are ambassadors, aren't we? Therefore, we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. So this idea in the Old Testament back here that the animals provided for reconciliation, that's what we do. Here's a glimpse of what it means for us to be a sacrifice. Care about people. Care about people. Don't be afraid to tell them you follow Jesus. They don't know who Jesus is. I've asked many people, so your animosity towards Christianity, is that because you studied it or because you have bought into a stereotype? And it's amazing. Every single person I've ever asked that question says, well, when you put it that way, I've bought into a stereotype. I let somebody else tell me about, well, well, maybe you should decide for yourself what you believe. Don't be afraid to tell people you're about Jesus. They don't know who he is. They need to know him. So we are reconcilers, 2 Corinthians 5. We are a grateful people. Just as the Old Testament sacrifice established the means for thanking the Lord and cultivating a thankful heart, so Christ's sacrifice generates thankfulness in our hearts for all that God has done. In 1 Thessalonians, I would argue, in fact, turn there to 1 Thessalonians, I would argue that this becomes part of the means through which the gospel is shared and spread. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Verse 6 and 7. There's place, many places throughout here where we could look at this. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with joy. With joy given by the Holy Spirit, and thus you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. I think being a grateful people is one of the primary means through which the power of the gospel is shared. I think that's why Paul concludes 1 Thessalonians with, in everything give thanks, for this is God's... What's the word? Will, Will for you. As a pastor, I'm surprised at the number of people, and as a professor, the students that come and say, I want to know what God's will is. Okay, give thanks. <laughs> no, 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 you missed it. I, I want to know what God wants me to become in life. Well, give thanks for everything. Or uh, avoid immorality. That's God's will for you. There's only a few handful of places to talk about it. Well, no, I'm trying to grasp what his vocation is. Do you give thanks in everything that you do? No. Well, why don't we start with the basics? <laughs> because this is one of those means by which God reflects his glory. If we don't know how to give thanks and be grateful, we have nothing to say to a world that is struggling to survive every hour. Every hour. In our county, Summit County, we live high in the mountains of Colorado, 9,100 feet and higher. Um, at my church, we have put together a visioning team to look at, answer the question, what should we be doing in the next three years that we're not doing today when it comes to ministry? So the first thing I did was I gave them the assignment to go out and uh, research the county. We did all this research, pulled in all this data, hours and hours of research, and then we had a night, a community night, we called it. We invited all the leaders to come in. We had the mayors, we had the police chief, the fire chief, superintendent of schools, we had the, all the social programs, we had the directors of the social programs come in, and they each took 15 or 20 minutes and shared with us what they were dealing with, and, um, and we asked them to say, we'd like to know two things. Number one is how we can pray for you, but number two is if we were to have resources available, either human resources or money, how could we come alongside and help you? Well, first of all, you should have seen the look on all the leaders' faces that there's a church that asked that question. And we did that. And they came in with these wonderful ideas. But you know what we found? We live in an absolutely devastating world. It's broken beyond what you could possibly imagine. In Colorado, 25% of the women have been raped and sexually abused. And they estimate only one in a third are, repeat, are uh, reported. I've seen studies that show 50% of your generation have been uh, sexually abused, 50% of your generation. I took our elders to our middle school meeting one night, said, how many young girls do you see? And they said, 20. I said, that means 10 of them have been sexually abused. You want to see their eyes fly open? Children, 9% of the children have been sexually abused, and they estimate only 1 in 10 has been reported. 9% a year. Now, that means that that 9% is not going to be repeated again next year because those offenders are now in jail. You get it? Divorce. People with divorce are 300, kids of divorce are 300% more likely to experience significant mental health issues. See it? 
The list goes on and on and on. There's no way, absolutely no way, we can overstate how broken this world is that we live in. If we can't be a grateful people, we have nothing to say to a world that has no hope. It is really important. The opposite way Paul says that is do everything without grumbling and complaining. This is not just an option. This is not just a nice way to live life. This is the very heart and soul of the gospel and the way we live our lives. This is sacrifice. And it is a true sacrifice to not complain. It is a true sacrifice to be thankful, to cultivate a grateful heart and all that happens. Well, what about remembrance? We are a people who remember. Just as the Old Testament sacrificial system provided a way for the people to remember all that God has done from the exodus through the forgiveness of their sins, 1 Corinthians 11 says communion provides a way for us to proclaim what Christ has accomplished. And it's not just his death. His death is symbolic of the incredible work that he did. The very last thing Paul says is, as often as you do this, you proclaim his death. To whom? Whom are we proclaiming it to? Later on in chapter 14, Paul is assuming that unbelievers, inquirers, are coming into the assembly. That's why he's concerned that you not offend them. So when you partake of communion, you are remembering what God has done, and you are making a statement of witness, just like in a court of law. If an unbeliever sees you taking communion, do they see it as a ritual, or do they look and do they say, wow, these people really believe in this God that they talk about. They really believe it. So we close every one of our services with communion, and we have everybody come up front. It's a big mess. It's wonderful. Life, energy, confusion, all of it together. But you know what? There's tears, and there's joy, and there's crying, and there's happiness. And we pray. We have people praying along the front. Because we want, when, un, when we bring our friends to church, we want them to say, these people really believe. And it's evident in the way they are partaking of communion. We are a people who remember. We are peacemakers. Just as the Old Testament sacrifices were a means of establishing peace with God and each other, so Christ established peace with God and each other as well. Ephesians 2. He broke down the barrier to the dividing wall. All you New Testament majors had to study that, right? And created peace. So we are to pray for peace and to work to live peaceful lives. 1 Timothy 2. I would argue that this is the means of glorifying God to our world because the very next verse says it's God's desire that all people be saved. Come to a knowledge of Him. If we cannot live a life of peace in our fellowships, we have nothing to say to a world that they can't even begin to grasp it, much less control it. We fail miserably at that. We are a holy people. Just as the Old Testament sacrifices taught the Israelites the difference between the holy and the common, so Christ models and teaches us what it means to be holy. 1 Peter 1, live holy lives. You know, I look at the law, maybe this is too simplistic for some of you, but I look at the law as a means of grace, but it's a means of making them a holy nation. When they come out of Egypt, they look just like the Egyptians. They haven't heard from God in 400 years. They, uh, they, it's only hearsay from now on. The legends, the stories have been passed down, but they've not heard from God. And they've only seen it, his, his attack on the gods of Egypt through the plagues. But they don't know really what he's like. And so he begins to give them laws in the Old Testament. And every time he gives them a law, they look a little different. A little different than the world around them. That's what holiness means. They're different. It's not a surprise that the Israelite men raped their women. Every nation in the world did. What's a surprise is God began the journey of saying, if you're going to do that, now you have to take care of them. And he puts in place laws on what it looks like when you rape. It's not a surprise that they had slavery. Every nation did that. But God put in place laws about how to treat those slaves, treat them with care. So every time he gives one of those 613 commands, they begin to look a little different than the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, all the people around them. That's what it means to be a holy nation. In other words, our character matters. What we do makes a difference. This is not just a book of, you know, have fun. This is a book of sacrifice. This is a book of what it means to live a life pleasing to the Lord. Your character really does matter. Say no when it's appropriate. 
We are a people who engender fellowship and unity, just as the Old Testament sacrifices provided a process by which a person who strayed from the Lord in community could be restored. So Christ brings us back into fellowship with God and each other. Ephesians 4, uh, 1 through 3 talks about this. Be very diligent to preserve the work of the unity, to maintain that unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. I've told our elders many times, if we only do one thing right, let's protect the unity. Satan is coming after us. If we do this, everything else will flow out from that. And I would argue that every imperative, every command in the rest of the book is all focused on how to maintain that unity in Ephesians. So, this is not something we accidentally fall into. This is a choice. If anyone desires to be my disciple, wills, fellow, he must or she must deny themselves, take up their cross. This is a choice that you have to make. It doesn't happen by default. We tend to marginalize it. We tend to wa- wash it away with all this language like we all have our cross to bear. Right? No, no, no. It's not it at all. This is a way of life. It is death to a whole way of life. Doing away with what's important to you. Those self-serving things. It involves going against the grain. Think of all the phrases that we could use. Common idioms. Going against the grain. Placing yourself on the firing line. Putting your neck in the noose. Getting your head, putting your head on the chopping block. It's a conscious decision on your part to do that. We have five seniors graduating this year at our high school. and we're, They don't know it yet. We're planning a rite of passage ceremony. The letting the women, we have six, one woman and five men. We're letting the women do the women because I have no idea what to do with them. They're on their own out there. But the guys, we have all these older guys and we're planning this night. It's going to be a surprise. They're going to show up at this location and there's going to be 20 old guys there like me. And we're going to go around and we're going to say to each of these five guys, starting with their fathers, let us tell you what we have observed in your life in 18 years or however long you've been with us. Let us tell you why we are proud of you. Um, we need you. And we're, we're framing a, a certificate about the, the uh, fighting the spiritual battle. We need you guys to step up to the line and be faithful. And we're all going to sign it, each one. And then we're going to take them out and do what guys do. Take them on. Find some competitive way. Skiing, who knows what it'll be. Take them on so that way they can kick our butts. <laughs> <laughs> Give them a rite of passage that this is important. We, we want you to go against the grain, to put yourself on the firing line. We need you to be faithful. The church needs you to be faithful. When I left home as an 18-year-old, in my generation of boomers, I'm sad to say it's, they're getting older now, not much, but they are, eight out of 10 of us returned to the church. In your generation, it's one out of 10, 10%. As a friend of mine at Den- Denver Seminary likes to say, you know what? We're trying to close the door after the horse has already escaped the barn. The youngest millennial is 13 or 14 now, and uh, we already lost your generation. We need you to be faithful. We need you to go after your peers. More about that later on. Living as sacrifices is a key part of sharing our faith to a lost world. It just is. It's how we do it. And God is very interested in this, this, uh, this lost world. The language of nations occurs everywhere. All peoples. I've been, I've been reminding my congregation for nine months. Every Sunday, every, I, I, I look for this language. Peoples, all peoples, let all the earth, all the nations. It just saturates the scriptures from beginning to end. This is what we are here for. It involves sacrifice. It involves paying a cost on behalf of others. That's what it means. Paying a cost on behalf of others. That's what sacrifice is. So now let me go back and remind you of what I said. Here's how I picture the Bible. A little simplistic, but it works for all the people in my church. You have the Old Testament focused on how Israel was going to be a blessing to the nations, ultimately realized in Christ. And then when you get to the New Testament, it just flowers. It moves out in all of these different directions. So all the different epistles are written to the different ethnic groups in the known world. And I would argue that that best accounts for some of the differences that we see. 1 Corinthians 11, doesn't nature herself teach you if a man has long hair, it's a dishonor? Apparently in Greek culture, that's the case. But in Jewish culture, that's not the case. The Nazarite vow, long hair is a way to honor God. 
there's a glimpse. Romans 7, I want the young widows to remain single. 1 Timothy 5, written to Ephesus, I want the young widows to remarry. I think that accounts for some of those differences that we see, that we're talking to different groups. And so when we work these core commands, love one another, when we work them down into culture and talk about what it means to live out this, it's going to look different in different cultures. For those of you that come from different cultures, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I never will forget sitting in a classroom across the way, and a professor said, the uh, meat offered idols is an Old Testament, I mean a New Testament idea, but it doesn't apply to us anymore. And a young lady raised her hand and she said, except in my culture where we still offer meat offered idols. Ooh. I remember as a young student go, ooh. <laughs> There's more to this big world than I realized. And now that I've been around the world and taught since I left the seminary many times, I realize that this Bible is so wonderful. It's the only great book that covers uh, culture after culture after cultural, century after century. You don't have to adopt the values of any one part of it because it is the record of God redeeming those values and overturning them. So in the Old Testament, when it's dealing with rape, that's a time when rape was acceptable. We don't have to adopt that cultural value. So God begins that slow journey of overturning that through the giving of rules and commands and laws of what it means to, to, to not do that. By the time we get to the New Testament and we understand true sexuality and how to care for one another, all those things are now in the past but they sure give us a glimpse of how a God moved, our God, the one true God, moved into this broken world and began to overturn some horrendous, horrendous cultural practices. He's not in a hurry. But he did sacrifice. And that's what we should do. So we're going to look um, next week at sacrifice and priesthood. That's what this week is all about. Uh, Today we talked about the cross. By the way, that's God's story. But you know what? It's also our story. It's not just his story. He created this story for us. And so now it becomes our story. We're part of it. What would your friends and neighbors who don't know Christ, what would they think? How would they like it if they knew that there was a story for them? That they belong to a story. I found my story. I'm part of it. That's what redemption is all about. What would it be like for them if they found that? We're going to talk about the different... Uh, ways that we present the gospel and some of the weaknesses, uh, the older models of evangelism, the evangelism explosion, the Romans road. A lot of those models are really beginning to lose traction. I want to talk about why in two days. Uh, I think there's a good reason why they're losing traction. So today we talked about sacrifice and cross. It's our story. Wednesday we're going to talk about sacrifice and priesthood. It's our calling. We are a kingdom of priests. What does it mean to be a priest? Well, once again, he uses an Old Testament word to help us capture what life is like today, true spiritual reality. So we have to go back and look at what it means and say, what does a priest do? And therefore, how do we live that out in our lives of our friends and neighbor? Thursday, we're going to look at sacrificing gospel. That's our message. What is the gospel? How do you proclaim it? What is, uh, what is wrong with some of the models? And why is it important that we be clear? Uh, we heard a lot of people, by the way, with the way we share the gospel. I have firsthand experience at that. And then finally, we're going to look at sacrifice and redemption, our life. You've been blessed so that you can live, be a blessing to others. You've been redeemed so that you can live a redemptive life with others. You've been forgiven so you can forgive others. You understand the, the picture, what I'm painting? If we don't know how to live a life of redemption, we have nothing to say to a world that is completely broken. If we don't know how to express joy, we have nothing to say to a hopeless and lost world. You see the see why our behavior matters? If we do not live sacrificial lives, we have nothing to say to a world which is consistently self-centered and searching to find happiness all in the wrong places. Ephesians 3.20, I'd like to close with this. Ephesians 3.20, one of the fantastic benedictions in the Bible. To God be the glory in Christ Jesus. That's what we expect it to say. What it says is, to God be the glory in the church. To God be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus. The way you live your life matters. It makes a difference. God, in his wonderful, confusing way, chose to use a bunch of bumbling idiots to glorify himself. That's us. To God be the glory in the church. Let me pray. 
Father, thank you for the chance to be back on campus and see so many friends and to meet new ones. I've just so enjoyed the students I've already met. Father, I pray that you would uh, bless us this week. Help us, Lord, to get a, a better grasp of what it means to live out our lives as sacrifices on behalf of the people around us that are hurting so deeply and yet are so ashamed they can't even say it. Uh, help us, Lord, to know how to do that. We pray these things in your son's name, Jesus, because we believe in him. And help us to reflect your glory as your church. In Jesus' name, amen.